Okay, I think uh, we'll get started. Uh, I see people are still coming in the back, but we'll go ahead and <clears throat> get going. So uh, first of all, welcome everybody. This is the final uh, program for this year in the 2018-19 Maury Strauss Distinguished Public Lecture Series of the Freyland Biomedical Research Institute. And uh, I'm glad to see that uh, Maury is here tonight. Maury, thanks so much for being here and supporting this program. I greatly appreciate it. And I see Steve and Leslie are here, and the dog is somewhere uh, down there. So great to see you all, as usual. Thank you so much. Very much. <laughs> so we will be announcing next year's series in a couple weeks. Uh, please check our website. We'll, of course, send it out to all of you on our email list. And make sure you know about the program coming up next year, which will be I think equally fantastic to this year's program. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Steve Hyman. Uh, Dr. Hyman is from uh, Harvard University, where he's a dis distinguished service professor of stem cell and regenerative biology. Uh, he also is the director of the, <coughs> uh, the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research of the Broad Institute at Harvard and MIT. I think I got that right. Uh, and uh, he's uh, a very powerful force and influential figure in mental health uh, research, policy, and leadership. I'll say a little bit about that, try not to take uh, too long. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Hyman did his undergraduate work at Yale and studied history and the arts and letters. Uh, he then went on to do a master's degree at Cambridge and did his medical degree at Harvard University. Uh, he did residency training in psychiatry at McLean Hospital in Boston. And from there, went on to do a clinical and research fellowship in neurology and medicine at Mass General. And then also did postdoctoral training in research in molecular biology and genetics after that um, at Harvard uh, with Howard Goodman at the time. He was invited uh, to join the faculty at Harvard, where he was initially an assistant professor, became a full professor of psychiatry. Uh, from there, he went on to the National Institute of Mental Health at the National Institutes of Health, become the director of NIMH. And for those of you who follow uh, the field at all or read anything about it, you would know he was truly transformational in that leadership role as well at NIMH, where he uh, really had a great influence on moving programs and launching into new areas to align with modern uh, molecular biology, genomics, computation, imaging, et cetera, uh, to try to get at some of the most thorny and difficult issues in, in mental health research. Um, <clears throat> after serving uh, in that capacity, went back to Harvard <clears throat> excuse me, as the provost of Harvard University. And I can only imagine the breadth of the issues he dealt with as provost. It shows uh, somebody who has a background in the arts and letters and medicine is very likely capable of taking on a lot of interesting and challenging areas and, and did that for, uh, I think, close to a decade or so. Uh, <clears throat> and then after that stint, uh, he became the distinguished service professor, as I said, of stem cell regenerative biology, director of the Stanley Center. He has numerous awards. Uh, he has recently served uh, as the president of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. Um, he's received the David Mahoney Prize for Communications of Science. I think another great example of the sort of things we're trying to do here this evening. The Distinguished Service Award of the American Psychiatric Association. Um, the National Academy of Memis Medicine Sarnat Prize in Mental Health. Elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, elected as a fellow of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, received the Presidential Meritorious Executive Rank Award, the Distinguished Service Award of the Alliance for the Mentally Ill, and the list goes on and on. And I think that tells you something about um, what he's done. Uh, as I think about how to introduce uh, Dr. Hyman, I, it, you know, I can talk about his science, and he's done a lot of really important science. If this was a regular seminar, I would focus in on some aspect of his work related to understanding neurotransmitters and how they affect receptors and genes. Very important work um, for psychiatry and a lot of areas of neurobiology. Or I might talk about some of his work that has uh, put forth uh, the treatise of the use of animal models in human studies and the important importance of that, or, or even the uh, studies of chronic drug addiction, how it affects gene expression. There's so much. And then you look at the work he's done on the, on the world stage as well as the national stage in leadership, such as with the World Health Organization's edition coming out of the International Classification of Disease and Related Health Problems. And I think that was supposed to come out recently, has it? It's out. <clears throat> okay, well, taking on really thorny issues or uh, issues related to uh, uh, mental health and people understanding the diagnostic and statistical manuals that have made uh, an error fundamentally in representing psychi psychiatric disorders as categories in a qualitative way versus in a, versus in a continuous quantitative way that opens doors and closes others that were wrong. My point being, I think as you look at this body of work, both in the laboratory, 
um, in leadership roles, the, the thing that stands out to me that's the thread is complex, tough issues. And so uh, Steve Hyman has taken on from the, from the very fundamental molecular biology issues at the earliest days of understanding gene expression or receptors, how that relates to mental health, psychiatric disease, addiction, what was then presaging where the field is going at that level. And then in his leadership roles, taking on the thornier issues of how you deal and define mental health and all the challenges associated with that, how you implement policy at the national level, at the global level. And uh, he's clearly somebody who doesn't shy away from the most important and the most complex problems. And so with that as a backdrop, I think we're in for a, a great evening to hear from him, his perspectives on some of the issues with respect particularly to genetics of mind. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Stephen Hunt. Thank you for that very kind introduction that I cannot possibly live up to. Um, I, let me just start with a disclaimer. I, 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 this, I get that this is a public lecture, and, and I am going to try to be uh, clear and, and explain things at the right level. I haven't changed all of my slides, but don't be put off. Um, I'm not a great artist, so I, um, I, I hope I can use uh, some of these slides to explain what I think are really, really important issues that we're going to be facing as a society. I'm going to begin talking about genetics from the point of view of a very serious disease, schizophrenia. But then I'm going to show how the very same technologies that we are applying uh, to understand the basic underpinnings of diseases like schizophrenia, autism spectrum disorders, bipolar disorder, and in other fields, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disorder, are now being used to study human traits that we account normal, normal forms of human cognition and behavior, and that we as a society are going to have to think through the utilization of how these tools are, are applied. But let me begin with uh, schizophrenia, which is uh, where, with respect to the brain, the tools of modern genetics have had so far the most impact. So let me just introduce uh, schizophrenia. Some of you uh, may know somebody with this disease. It affects about one in 100 people worldwide. Uh, it begins, it's most famous for psychotic symptoms, for hallucinations and delusions and disorganized behavior, but that's not actually the core of the illness. The illness begins often insidiously in mid-teen years with loss of ground cognitively. People lose the ability to uh, uh, use what's called working memory, which is critical for the ability to control your own thoughts and emotions and behaviors. And with the loss of working memory, people uh, stop being able to, to succeed in school, stop being able to work because they, they find it difficult to remember and keep appointments. They uh, may behave inappropriately. Along with this cognitive decline come so-called deficit symptoms. People will um, begin to have impoverished thought, blunted affect, meaning you, know, you tell them something that should make a normal person sad and they're pretty stony about it. They lose their motivation. And this is often misunderstood because, again, they haven't had any hallucinations or delusions yet, and people will sometimes think that they're being lazy or they're just being ornery. Um, and, and of course, there are many more common causes than incipient schizophrenia for somebody who's done well in school previously to start doing poorly in school or to disappear into their finished basement and play video games and lose their friends, right? So, um, so, so it's hardly the first thing anyone would think of. But then in late teens or early 20s, these psychotic symptoms begin. And we frankly uh, have been, as a medical community, uh, often moved and sometimes mesmerized by the dramatic nature of these symptoms, but we haven't understood them. Now, in terms of treatment, um, this has been typical of the history of psychiatric treatment. Um, there, there have been all kinds of, because the symptoms are so dramatic, there are all kinds of theories that, um, 
that were based on salient life events and unfortunately in the 1950s and 60s and really into the 70s there were uh, psychiatrists who were uh, followers of uh, uh, not of Freud himself but of students of Freud who decided that uh, mothers putting kids in a double bind, being both too close and at the same time critical, somehow caused this, these terrible symptoms. And there was even this term schizophrenogenic mothers, which looking back from my vantage just seems like the worst fiction one could imagine, especially because for a family it's so tragic to have a kid who becomes ill and then you know, you're being blamed into the bargain. Um, but uh, uh, in the 1950s, the first drugs that could treat, not schizophrenia per se, so there are no drugs that treat the core cognitive disability, these deficit symptoms, but we have antipsychotic drugs that work not just for the psychosis of schizophrenia, but also when people with Alzheimer's disease have psychosis, they work. When people with other diseases have psychosis, they work. Psychosis is what happens when the connections in the brain are not working well enough or you've lost enough of them that you're misprocessing everything going on in the world. But as is typical for psychiatry, in an era when frankly the brain was just too complicated and we didn't have any traction, uh, we discovered these drugs by serendipity. So a company in France uh, developed uh, a new class of antihistamines. I mean, we know antihistamines, right, for we use them, certain old ones, as sleep aids, and we use them to fight allergies. But they were interested in the effect of antihistamines on all kinds of systems in the body. And uh, they, they synthesized a drug, which we now know as, by the brand name of Thorazine. The chemical name was chlorpromazine. And its first use was by a surgeon in France, Henri Labory, who used it as a pre-anesthetic. That is, he gave it to patients as, as is done before surgery to sedate them, to dry up secretions so they wouldn't choke when they were being given anesthesia. And he was so shocked by the degree of sedation that he called up his friends at the mental hospital, uh, DeLay and Deneker, and said, why don't you try this on your agitated psychotic patients? It turned out that the sedation was a side effect. And to everybody's shock, these people, some of whom had been hallucinating and had these complex delusions that they were being pursued, I guess in France it would be by the gendarmerie, not the CIA, um, uh, the, these, these, these symptoms started to melt away. Uh, and and lo this was the first antipsychotic drug. And since then, drug companies have made lots and lots, made 40 or 50 more of them, but all of them are just slight tweaks on the original one. I mean, they have much less in the way of side effects and so forth, but, but we've made no substantial progress. And we still have no treatments for the core parts of schizophrenia, these cognitive symptoms and deficits. And the outcomes are terrible. You know, because of antipsychotic drugs, which are good, it was thought that we could close mental hospitals and deinstitutionalize people. And that was actually humane because many of the mental hospitals were you know, I, I, uh, early in my career, I worked in some of them, I saw them. They, they, they really were ill cared for because they were places of hopelessness, right? Uh, but I think people didn't realize how difficult, how costly it would be to treat these very sick people as outpatients. So if somebody has schizophrenia, you can't give them an appointment card and say, you know, a week from Tuesday, show up at the psychopharmacologist uh, and expect them to actually show up. Actually, as, as a core part of the disease, remember the working memory deficit, they, they're not going to do that, right? They can't do that. It's not because they don't want to. They can't do that. And so it's been a catastrophe, and it has led to homelessness. And now, in many communities, actually, the mental hospitals have been replaced by prisons because uh, people are vagrant, they trespass, they commit lots and lots of typically minor crimes. And the other thing is that uh, given all of these factors, uh, life expectancy for somebody with schizophrenia, depending on the country, is diminished between eight and 20 years. So it's really very serious business. Now, we, through such technologies as neuroimaging, uh, we've learned a lot about what happens in the brain in schizophrenia. So this is an image 
Uh, this is the front of the brain, this is the back of the brain, and, and this is uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, just looking at the thickness of the cerebral cortex, the gray matter layer that covers our brain that's critical for thinking. And uh, in th this is sort of a pseudo color representation of significance, but what you can see is the, the very frontal part of the brain and the temporal parts of the brain, which are the working memory requires just exactly this prefrontal cortex, but many other higher cognitive functions require a healthy cortex. These things are excessively thin. There, there's a loss of neural substance in people with this disease that actually develops during teen years. Uh, and unlike Alzheimer's disease, which many of you know about, the neurons don't die, but what happens is they have too few of the connections that normally allow the brain to function. And we, we can ignore uh, this bit. Uh, but, but the trouble, so, so we know this, and it explains, it correlates with some of the cognitive loss. But it doesn't tell us the underlying mechanism. It doesn't tell us where we should go to find a treatment or how to intervene. And so it has been, I could have talked about autism, I could talk about depression, I could talk about bipolar disorder. Progress has been slow, so why? Why has progress been so slow for these disorders? Well, I think everybody in this room probably understands that the brain is in many ways the most complex object ever tackled by human science. But that's not all. Uh, we don't have access to living human brain tissue. I mean, sometimes there's neurosurgery and we can get a piece of tissue, uh, but for the most part, we have to look indirectly with brain imaging. Um, we can increasingly look with physiology, sometimes with implanted electrodes, but we can't easily get tissue. Now, cancer is a really hard problem, of course, but at least in cancer, so this is dividing cancer cells, a surgeon does an excisional biopsy of the cancer, and the scientist is waiting right outside the operating room door, and the surgeon hands them the disease, right? So that is at least a scientific advantage. Uh, this is a picture, the, the Incas did this uh, procedure, not the only culture that did it, it's called trephination, where they would make a hole in the skull, presumably to allow the exit of evil spirits. I don't think it was ever subjected to rigorous clinical trials. <laughs> the practice has fallen into disuse. But even, you know, the point is even if we could get a piece of tissue, it wouldn't answer the problems because the symptoms of these disorders, whether it's schizophrenia or, or depression, have to do with widely distributed neural circuits. Those are the kinds of things we can see at work with neuroimaging. It's just that what we can't get from that yet is the underlying mechanism, you know, what exactly is going wrong at a molecular level. But the other thing is, you know, for Alzheimer's disease, not that we have exploited it wisely and have treatments, but at least in post-mortem exams, there's a predominant biochemical pathology. You find amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, and you can, you, those are clues to what's going on in the brain. Not so for these early onset disorders. Even though we have, I showed you a picture of excessive thinning, um, that we don't find any real biochemical difference, any mechanistic difference looking at those brains, at least nothing we can hang our hat on. We find lots of, lots of, lots of little differences. Um, and the animal models, um, suffice it to say, for these complex human mental disorders have not gotten us very far. And there are reason we could talk about that later, but, but uh, again, this is very much unlike um, some, uh, you know, in, in cancer, again, you can take these cells and you can implant them in an immunosuppressed mouse and you can see what they do. And, and we don't have models of that utility. And then finally, you've already heard about my battle with this uh, document, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of Mental Disorders. This, this document was formulated uh, uh, to, to try to organize psychiatry so that two different doctors would agree that this person has a particular diagnosis. Prior to the, the DSM-3 in 1980, uh, there was no organized way of agreeing on what schizophrenia meant. But the trouble is that uh, the document was formulated in a fundamentally pre-scientific era, 
Uh, in fact, we still don't know all that much. And what happens when you have a document like this and to get your bills reimbursed by Blue Cross or Medicare, you need to write down a DSM diagnosis and we make our residents memorize it for exams and, and, we, and journal editors make people use these diagnoses when they write papers, presumably so that people will be talking about the same thing. All of a sudden it becomes real. And the trouble is it's actually a very poor mirror of nature. And so nature has been tough enough on us, but the humans haven't been so helpful. Um, and we have to get beyond this. Okay, so that's pretty pessimistic. But actually, we've, there's always been a clue. If only we could grasp it, and that's been genetics. So this is a study from many, many years ago from Irv Gottesman, Gottesman and Shields. And I could take you through this, this graph, but what it says is the more DNA you share with a person who has schizophrenia, the higher your likelihood of having schizophrenia, right? So if you have a first degree relative, or if you have an identical twin with schizophrenia, you have a 50% chance of having schizophrenia. You actually have a 100% chance of having something wrong with your brain that we can identify, but a 50% chance of actually having full-blown schizophrenia. If you have a first-degree relative, a sibling, a child, a parent, um, you have a greater risk than if you have a second-degree relative, and, and so on. So we know that even though genes are not fate, I've already told you if you have an identical twin with schizophrenia, you have as much as a 50% chance of having schizophrenia, but only a 50% chance. So other things matter, brain development, which could, bad luck might matter there, but also environmental factors. But not mother putting you in a double bind. The environmental factors are probably much more physical kinds of environmental factors. If I could quantify the uh, genetic contribution to mental illness with numbers, um, we have this idea of heritability. Now heritability is a, uh, very, it's often misunderstood. What it means is uh, within a given population, because let's start with height. Uh, adult height is 90% of adult height, de depends on the genes that a, a child gets when the deck is shuffled. And usually that is pretty close with, with some bell curve around it to their biparental mean, right, um, corrected for gender. In short, what that means in straightforward language is that tall parents usually have tall kids and short parents usually have short kids. And sometimes, the variants, a, a, some short parents may have a very tall kid, but, but in the next generation, there's a re regression to the mean, right? So, because the, the, the genetic deck is getting shuffled, okay? So heritability, but, but the key thing about heritability for height is it really matters whether you have adequate childhood nutrition. Right? So heritability describes the, the variance explained by genes in a particular population given exposed to a certain environment. Now, that means there is, um, you know, we, we shouldn't overinterpret it, we shouldn't fetishize it, and, and, and sometimes when people hear heritability, they assume that something is deterministic and, uh, you know, is, is, will, is relentlessly the case. Uh, what I've interpreted to mean is if something is highly heritable, it means that molecular geneticists can work on it, right? You're going to find something important. So, but the, the heritability of autism spectrum disorders is about 80%. 80% of the variance explaining the difference between people in populations that have been studied are due to genes. For schizophrenia, it's about 80%. For major depression, just to give you a contrast, it's much less. It's 35%. That's still a lot. But for major depression, lived experience, losses, disappointments, uh, a chaotic childhood, a history of being abused, matter a great deal. And, that, uh, uh, and, 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 and the genes, therefore, proportionately explain less. Okay. I said these things about heritability. Um, so we want to find these genes. Why do we want to find these genes? We want to find these genes because genes tell us about causation. Now, normally in biology, we always warn our students, don't confuse correlations with causes, right? Um, 
we say that just because um, you know eating lots of pulled pork is associated with cardiovascular disease, at least I believe we haven't proved causation. Um, but uh, but genes are different. Genes are different because your genetic sequences are laid down at the moment of fertilization, right before any other developmental processes. Any other observation in biology can be a cause, but it can also be a result of the, if it's a disease or a result of the disease as opposed to a cause. We don't know which way the causal arrow points. Or it could be an adaptation, right? Or it could be a treatment effect. And we can sort out a treatment effect usually. But because genetics were there from the beginning, ab initio, they play a causal role. Now, we have to be very careful to interpret it. Here's an example. In, in the first big genetic study of lung cancer, uh, people were looking for, they thought, genes that might point to cell divisions or failures of cells to stop division, so-called oncogenesis. They, they already knew that the environment played a big role in lung cancer, right? Pollutants, cigarettes. The only result that came out of that first big genetic study were the receptors for nicotine in the brain. So that was causal, right? Be but it was causal because the population they studied was confounded, meaning all of the people, or most of the people in their lung cancer study were also smokers, right? And the smoking actually is causally involved in lung cancer. Uh, but they didn't find genes involved in why cells divide out of control. But that's a lesson, right? Just because we find genes, it doesn't mean that they point to the biological processes that we thought we would discover, right? It, it forces us to think much more broadly. But anyway, this is our chance to find causation. So we can't get living tissue. We can't get living tissue from whole brains. Uh, we don't have biochemical footprints like Alzheimer's disease. This is the best clue I think we are ever going to have to what causes autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. But the problem is our brains are not like Mendel's peas. So perhaps in high school or freshman in college, you were tortured by uh, this uh, Austrian monk's work. And let me just say that his great genius was ignoring everything he didn't understand. <laughs> he ignored almost all traits, because almost all traits that matter are the result of many, many, many genes acting together, plus the environment. Instead, he found a small number of things where a single gene, autosomal dominant or recessive, explained all of the variants. That is, you know, 100% heritability. So you may remember that his peas were either yellow or green, or wrinkled or smooth, or tall or short, or had white flowers and pink flowers. Those were the, quote, Mendelian traits, traits where one gene explains all of the action. And if you cross uh, a yellow pea and a green pea, the next generation is all yellow because the big Y gene from pea number one is dominant over the little Y gene that leaves you with a green pea from pea number two. But some of these in the second generation will actually be harboring a silent recessive version. And in the next generation, if you do enough experiments, this, this green guy will have two of the little Y recessive genes, and the others will either have two big Ys or a mixture of the two. Right? And, but this is actually explains almost no human genetics that we care. <laughs> but here's the problem. For the, the traits we care about, for normal cognitive ability, for uh, normal behavioral variation, but also for all common illnesses, many hundreds of genes, actually many thousands of flavors of these hundreds of genes contribute. Now, I will come back to uh, maybe a slightly teleological explanation for why that is. In a bit, but the the empirical fact is that these conditions that we care about, like schizophrenia, like autism, uh, and also like IQ and like you know risk taking, uh, are highly polygenic. 
And, 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 and of course, that means that to discover genes and therefore causes, we're going to have to find many, many, many genes of very small effect. And until the Human Genome Project in the early parts of the 21st century, we just didn't have the tools to do that. The bottom line is, one, one take home is, there's, like, there's no schizophrenia gene. There's no criminality gene. There's no genius gene, right? There are actually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of genes that are contributing in different combinations. And because there are so many genes, it also tells you that anyone with schizophrenia or anyone with type 2 diabetes or anyone with coronary artery disease has their own private personal grab bag of risk genes above a certain threshold so that they get there, plus whatever environmental cofactors are necessary. And that's why something like personalized medicine is important because uh, even though in the end, um, you know, type 2 diabetes, you might have a different age of onset, you might have more or less sensitivity to insulin in your, in your liver, in your muscle cells, and so forth. But it looks pretty much the same. But underlying it, there are many different paths, many different genetic paths to get there. Now, those genetic paths ultimately do converge on a finite number of mechanisms. Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't get that trait, that phenotype. But, but that complexity explains why, in part, a given medicine may work for one person with schizophrenia or diabetes or coronary artery disease and not another person because they've had different underlying inputs into their illness. Okay. Um, the most common kind of genetic variation. So geni what genetics does is it tries to take differences in the spelling of our different genes in, in our genetic structure and correlate that with traits, disease traits, normal traits, P traits, whatever, right? So we have three billion letters in our genomes, right? Um, and uh, DNA is double helix and uh, it is, uh, there are, the, the letters are actually called nucleotide bases, uh, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and um, they act by forming binding sites for proteins that stick to DNA, and also in, in, in triplets, they, they specify proteins, but let's not, you know, I, I don't want to put you to sleep. Um, what matters, though, is that we have three billion bases, and, and DNA replication, when we make a new embryo, a new human, or a new, actually there's a doggy here, so we shouldn't scare a doggy, but the same is true for doggies. DNA replication isn't perfect. So for every new child, you have 50 or 60 new changes in your DNA. Now, most of them are silent. Um, and, and if you get a bad one, that embryo will not survive, right? The, the, often, it, uh, you know, the, you say, well, there was no pregnancy, but actually the, that embryo couldn't implant because it had some lethal mutation, right? Um, so we don't even know about those. Um, but but um, most of these mutations, well, the ones we see are clearly not lethal. Babies are born and they grow up. But these differences in spelling, and they mostly involve a single letter, like this G becomes an A, and then because G is always across from C, this becomes a T. These spelling differences, this is called a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, is a single letter change. Um, it, and there are bigger changes, but these are the most common. This explains much of our human diversity, right? Uh, we differ, you know, um, I don't know you, but I'm sure we differ at more than 10 million SNPs because there's some average. We, we should. And you can say hello to your neighbor and you know that you're all differing by tens of millions of SNPs. And that, you know, the environment matters. I'm not discounting the environment. But that has a lot to say with what, why some person is an inch or two taller than another and somebody has more trouble keeping off weight and somebody is more susceptible to uh, an infectious disease, and not, not yet, the environment matters, things are not working on their own, but a, a, a substrate for a lot of our diversity 
flow. Now, we think our tendencies um, are written in, the, in, in this diversity. And so the goal of genetics is simply to say, um, uh, we can ignore this, the, the analysis here is which, uh, which, which version of the gene your, your mother or your father, we can ignore that. Let's say that we have two flavors of a gene, uh, the red flavor and the purple flavor, and they differ by a single SNP. And we can ask the question, uh, if, if we're studying schizophrenia, do, do people with schizophrenia, on average, if we look at a big enough population, tend to have more red or more purple? Now, for most genetic differences, they'll, it'll all wash out. It'll, it'll be 50-50. It'll just, and you have to do enough of a sample to see this. But if you do enough people and you study a, a, enough of these associations, you will find that maybe, just maybe, uh, having the purple flavor of, of this gene increases your likelihood of having schizophrenia by 2% or 3%. And then that, that's small, but it tells us that that gene in which the flavor matters for schizophrenia risk, where a small nudge is pushing just a little bit more toward schizophrenia, or a little bit away from schizophrenia, that that gene has something to say about how we build our brains. And then if we can study that gene, knowing it's going to tell us something about building our brains, as long as we're careful, right? Remember the smoking, right? The, the lung thing. You've got to be smart. But, but this is laborious. Now, it wasn't possible until the first schizophrenia genes that, that, that stand up were only published in 2009. And what, what has happened? Technology. We didn't get any smarter. I always teach my students that, you know, Galileo obviously was brilliant and changed our view of the solar system, the universe. But what really led, what, what led him built his telescope and see the four, uh, the four Medicean moons of Jupiter were incremental improvements in the ability to grind glass into lenses and mirrors, right? Technology. Then he could build his telescope. Then you can get excommunicated and all those other things, <laughs> well, right? Uh, so what, what happened in the Genome Project is, is the, this is a picture of the DNA sequence. The cost, the first, let's guess that the first human sequence costs about $100 million. That's not scalable, right? But with technological development, we can now get a whole three billion uh, base pair human sequence at reasonable depth for $500 and it keeps coming down. Um, even better, um, humans are a young species and actually uh, humans migrated out of Africa mm, 50 to 100,000 years ago. It keeps changing, it's a fossil evidence, it's changing. Um, um, but we were evolving for a really long time and, uh, and, and, and since the, the African exodus that populated the rest of the world hasn't been that many generations. So uh, many of the genetic variants, many of the SNPs we have are common across all of humanity. And because they're common across all of humanity, and by the way, the same diseases are common across all of humanity, we take these ancient common uh, DNA versions, these alleles, and, and put them on a microarray. We can print them, etch them on, on what's called a, a DNA chip. And we can interrogate human genomes at a hundred, at, at let's say a million places in the genome to get an overview for about $20. And this I'm going, to, I'm going to talk more about this microarray work because this has allowed the study of hundreds of thousands, even millions of people, which is now going on because it's so inexpensive. And it doesn't give you information about more recent rare mutations. We, we don't put rare things on this SNP chip. The, 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 those are common variants. Versions of genes that, 
usually are found in at least 5% of human populations. For rare variants, for recent things, we do have to sequence, but that, that's, that can be for mostly another day. So this is the result you get. It's called a Manhattan plot because it's got skyscrapers. So let me explain this because this is just foundational. So these are your chromosomes across the bottom, chromosome one, two, three, four, five, six, right? This study, about to be published, had 65,000 people with schizophrenia, 87,000 in trolls, that is, comparison subjects who were, who didn't have schizophrenia, same age and ethnicity. And what we're doing on this chip is we're interrogating each of about a million gene flavors against, you know, about 150,000 different human genetic factors. And we're asking, do any of them statistically survive the question, if you have schizophrenia, do you have a higher percentage? Does one flavor, let me turn around. Does one flavor of a gene give you a slightly higher risk of having schizophrenia? And this is just the probability that something is true. For those of you who are uh, statistically adept, this red line, which is really minimal, uh, is a p-value of 0.05 corrected for a million comparisons of the chip. Okay, but, but this one, this very tall skyscraper, which I'll come back to, um, is that the probability that, uh, uh, that this is not true is 10 to the minus 42. So the, given large enough populations, these things become really, really certain. Now, these are so we have, actually the truth is today we have about 300 places on the genome that we know tell us something about increase the risk of schizophrenia. And another version of the same locus will decrease the risk of schizophrenia. So we can begin to now ask, what, are they t what is this telling us? Now, um, but, but before, I get to that. I just I, I promised I would come back to this. Why are these why do we have genes of such small effect? Right? Why aren't we like Mendel's peaks? Well, let's look a male with schizophrenia, this is this is called by the <coughs> demographers a fecundity study. It's basically asking how many offspring does somebody with a particular trait have compared with their siblings? So good control. They're siblings who don't have that trait. Okay. And this has been done in a number of Scandinavian countries. This study is from Sweden, our A male with schizophrenia has about a quarter as many children as their unaffected siblings. A male with autism has about a quarter as many children as their unaffected siblings. Females have slightly more. Females have a later onset of schizophrenia and slightly uh, less severity, um, but still they have about 40% as many children as their uninfected female siblings. And you know, you can see big decrements in fecundity for anorexia nervosa, even bipolar disorder. You know, sometimes there are these um, um, jokes made about people with bipolar disorder who are out of control and you know, you would think they are one of the ways they're out of control is that they're out um, engaging in a lot of sex. But actually, what really matters is if you have one of these terrible early onset behavioral disorders, it's hard to form a care bond and, and a family. And so even people with bipolar disorder have, uh, which has later onset and, and periods of health, have only about 80% as many uh, uh, kids as their own siblings. So what does this mean? It means that any flavor of it, in any gene, that, that increases the risk substantially of any one of these early onset behavioral disorders is quickly going to be swept out of the gene pool, right? Right, there's a huge, people sometimes ask, with modern medicine, has evolution stopped? No. Now it's really important, what we're seeing is cleansing, what's called cleansing selection, not of humans, this is not eugenics, it's of alleles. 
So alleles that, that form of genes that cause a high risk of one of these early behavioral disorders are gone from the gene pool, usually in about three generations. And what's left are things that are small. Now, for illnesses like Alzheimer's disease that occur late in life and evolution stop caring about people like me, which is not nice that, um, <laughs> then you can have some bigger alleles, right? Because you don't have the same selection pressure. But most of them are still small, and that's because these, these although we can think of these as Alzheimer's genes, are actually affecting a lot about cognition and behavior. And if you mess up those genes, you get some of these very bad effects. And, and there's just strong selection against uh, these, again, these, these, these behaviors that affect social cognition, your ability to form bonds and families. Um, and and, and that, I think that, that explains partly why we, uh, it, it's not that evolution hated scientists and wanted to give us hard things to work on. It's, 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 it's really the effects of these genes. So we have these small effects. How can we profit from them? How can we actually help people with schizophrenia if the effects I, if, we, if, if I have to deal with hundreds and hundreds of genes of small effect, uh, the average in that Manhattan plot I showed you the average positive increases the risk of schizophrenia by about 8%. So if the population base rate of schizophrenia is 1%, you have a 1.08% risk of having schizophrenia for each one of, on average, of those alleles that you have. Obviously, there's different effect sizes. So one insight is that instead of looking at, you know, this is the ADHD, schizophrenia, the depressive disorder, instead of studying these in isolation, we can aggregate the signal. And this is called a polygenic score. OK. Um, basically, you can add up the effects of, ignore the sigma, ignore the, you can, you can create a weighted sum where for each peak in the GWAS, the effect size, what is the increase in risk for that peak? Um, a weighted sum of all of the effects of those of risk alleles. And then you can go to a person and look at, do a gene chip, right? 23 and me. I mean, I mean, we're, 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 search, we're using better gene chips, but it's the same principle. Ancestry.com. In fact, there are companies you can send your 23 and me results to other companies and they'll tell you your IQ gene. I don't recommend this, by the way, but you know. And for a price, they'll tell you anything. Um, um, you can go to a person and say, where do they fit in? Are they in the, in terms of this polygenic score, this sum, in the most severe decile of risk, or um, in the lowest 10%, the least severe decile of risk? And you start to create a prediction. Now, it's really important. These are terrible predictors about individuals. Remember, genes by themselves are not fake. A polygenic score tells you only about what we can measure on a gene chip. Common alleles, common variants, not rare variants, tells you nothing about the environment, right? So these are probabilistic and partial. But actually, they are the first objective replicable biomarker measures of risk of mental disorders. And actually, in medicine, we're pretty used to this, right? If you want to know about risk of cardiovascular disease or breast cancer, there, there are these, these sum, you sum things, right? So for cardiovascular disease, it is um, smoking behavior plus lipid levels plus blood pressure plus yes, no diabetes. And now, polygenic score for, because there are people who get heart attacks nonetheless. And, and, and so we have a more complete risk predictor for cardiovascular disease. But for schizophrenia, manic depressive so we now have our first piece, and that's these polygenic scores. Okay, I'm gonna. Now, it's really important to point out that European people of European ancestry, like myself, represent 14% of world population. But something like 90 some odd percent of all genetic studies that have ever been done, well, you know, I worked in Finland and Denmark, right? It, uh, there are these amazing population registries and electronic medical records. But what we've learned is that polygenic scores begin to break down as we go in their predictive value because even though the diseases are the same, and we can go to the technical reasons for that, for those of 
anyone is interested, is because whenever you find a an allele that is associated with disease between a European or East Asian and African, the effect size is always the same and the directionality is the same. But the frequency, by living on different continents for X number of generations, we had genetic drift. And so the pointers on a chip toward that genetic risk is different. And so if we were to apply a schizophrenia a European polygenic score to an East African for height or for schizophrenia, we've got a meaningless answer. So um, for scientific reasons, to really understand all the contributors to the disease, we really have to collect all the data. And also for global health equity. You know, if, I'm sure in most cities, if you go to a clinic uh, uh, and you, the populations are very diverse, and you don't want to have a test where you can say, I, we can only, this test will apply to this 30% of people in this clinic and the rest of you, you're out of luck. So the world better catch up. We're not, we're not doing very well. Uh, it hasn't gotten better since this was first recognized in 2014. Now, one other thing we can do with polygenic scores, which kind of kills the DSM, is we can ask, whether the genetic underpinnings of two different conditions are the same or different. It turns out, so this is a sort of a bit nasty to read, but if we look at this column, which is schizophrenia, and we're just asking the, the, the magnitude of the overlap, what we can see is that schizophrenia has a significant overlap with bipolar disorder. In fact, quantify it. Schizophrenia and bipolar disorder share about 65% of their risk. Now, there are different illnesses. People with bipolar disorder with bipolar lithium, people with schizophrenia don't, people with schizophrenia have much more cognitive impairment. But there are lots and lots of patients who I would say have not read our textbooks, like, like the DSM, who have intermediate symptoms. And there are people who, um, with get a diagnosis of, say, schizophrenia when they're 18, and then it shifts to schizoaffective disorder when they're 22, and then bipolar disorder when they're 25, and translithium. This is demoralizing and unhelpful. Uh, if we personalize this, we would see that somebody has this intermediate co combination of risk alleles. And again, we don't get understand the environment at the moment. We get more and we like that. Or somebody, we know that people who have an anxiety disorder in teen years are very likely to develop a second anxiety disorder and then a case of major depression in their mid to late 20s. And they end up with four or five diagnoses, right? It's, it, it's if you got a name comorbidity. It sounds terrible. But actually, because of the sharing between major depressive disorder and other illnesses, it's kind of understandable. It's one process that at different developmental stages having had different life experiences uh, produces different kinds of symptoms. Okay, now we're gonna run out of time, so I'm going to skip to what I want us all to think about and worry about. Um, so it's not just, I, I talk about, you know, we, all, we work on disease because, well, that's the public health problem, that's what we wanna solve, that's where the NIH funds. But it's not, I, I've already mentioned things like height. It's not that genetics only works for disease and then leaves us alone, right? So if you look at this chart, uh, this, is, this is full twins, monozygotic twins, dizygotic twins, that's fraternal twins who share half of their DNA. It's very much like the chart I showed you at the outset about schizophrenia, it's just a different format. These are full siblings raised together, full siblings raised apart. And what you can see are these clusters. So in blue is height. So the correlation in height for monozygotic twins is almost 100%, almost 1.0. Whereas for uh, fraternal twins or full siblings versus three relatives, it's, a, it's about 0.6, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if they're raised uh, uh, apart, now these are probably populations that all have good nutrition. So the effective environment separate them, but for other traits, the environment uh, might matter, so, uh, so something like uh, years of schooling, if somebody was adopted into a family that was very educationally oriented and one not, you would see 
But you see that these, again, the more DNA you share with somebody, the more likely you are. Right? It's not fate, it's not deterministic, but, but there's a substantial contribution. And of course, you know, we always play this game in all of our families. Who does, you know, Junior look like and whose habits do they have? Well, where did that come from? Uh, it comes from genes, and not only from genes, but it comes from genes. Now, it's really important, again, I said this before, but it's really important. Um, the individual prediction is really poor. So, my colleague, Ben Neal, who studies these kinds of things, you know, took a class of 25 students in an anthropology class, probably at Harvard, and this is height and men and women. You know, men tend to be a bit taller than women, so they, they segregate. But if you look at, now here we're not measuring genes on check, we're just looking at mid parent <coughs> We're talking about the same, by the way, for I2. And we're looking at the correlation of students. You know, we could measure the, 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 the this person, the uh, student stature is like 185 centimeters and the parents were mid-parent, it was 170. It, you know, this is, this is spelled for, we, for any given person, we can't look at their GWAS and say, you're gonna be this height, your, your IQ is gonna be this, you're gonna like, um, you know, bourbon, <laughs> right? That's, that's really silly, but, People have pursued, I want you to hold in mind that this is not some nefarious predictor because people misinterpret it, but people have certainly pursued these normal traits, these normal human types, none more than educational attainment. Because it turns out that on the, every questionnaire for mental illness, people, there's a question, what grade did you get to? And once you're gene checking somebody, then you have the GWAS, the, the, the genetic study of educational attainment. Or you can say, what grade did you get to spit in the tube? Right, it's just really easy to do this. 1.1 million people have been genotyped for educational attainment. And here's a Manhattan plot, just like schizophrenia. And so we can ask, what's going on in the brain or elsewhere in the body that contributes to educational attainment? And for my neurobiologist colleagues, it turns out, surprisingly, actually reassuringly, lots of genes that encode proteins in synapses, the connections between neurons, are involved in educational attainment. But it's not just cognitive ability. It's, for reasons critical, we don't understand a lot of it, but a lot of it has to do with not having ADHD and having emotional stability. And I don't think we have a GWAS for grit, but you know, I'm sure we would find people who overcome obstacles, right? Uh, and there's also genetics, I'm not showing you, about social mobility and that, that you know, there's an overlap, just in the way that schizophrenia and bipolar overlap, genes that enhance the likelihood of social mobility overlap with educational attainment. Now, before you think I'm losing it here, this GWAS, at the maximum, the best we can ever do is explain 25% of the variance for educational attainment. Because 75% is what country did you grow up in? And you know, all this other stuff, right? So it's only 25% of the variance. Well, school quality is only about 25% of the variance. And we care a lot about school quality. So what I'm trying to get you to see is let's not overvalue this, but not let's let's also not say this is this is in the noise. It's not in the Right. And there's going to be an important social policy issue that I'm going to raise. And before I do, I just want to go back to this figure showing overlap based on college and school. <coughs> so often we think of mental disorders as only deficit. Okay, so autism, spectrum disorders. Autism spectrum disorders have two major clusters. One are people who get bad de novo mutations, that is a new mutation in and those kids tend to have autism symptoms. They don't have low IQ. 
But 90 to 95% is polygenic, right? It's, it's just many, many genes. If you look at polygenic autism, uh, ASDs, it is positively correlated with college attainment, with years of education, with intelligence tests. What does this mean? It means that, it doesn't mean that every smart kid is on the spectrum. But what it means is that some of the same genetic components that contribute to ASDs in some combination over a threshold also contribute to higher IQ and to education. Right? And, you know, uh, kids with diagnosable ASDs often have incredible potential mechanisms of distraction. You can talk, I mean, I'm a little vague with speculative, but you can, you can see how these things might associate. Um, OCD, also associated with college attainment, years of education, cognitive performance, a little bit with intelligence, but also with neuroticism, which is a term which just means, you know, uh, basically an anxious response to all kinds of stimuli. So there's good and bad for all of these, right? But what the, but this is this is uh, I'm going to end because I don't want to I, I don't want to lose all of you. I just um, move ahead. Here's a here here's a company. It's called Genomic Prediction. It's real. That wants to team up with IVF. And the following thing happens in IVF clinics. Something called pregestational diagnosis. So before you implant an embryo, and this is really important for people who are having IVF because they have Huntington's disease in the family. They don't want to implant embryo that has Huntington's disease. But, but it, it, even if you're doing IVF just for reproductive assistance, you don't want to implant an embryo that has some strange chromosomal uh, rearrangement that occurred in the process generating these embryos. You take one cell when you test it. Well, now you can put it on a chip. Right? And here's a company that is saying a little bit disingenuously, by putting it on a chip, we can prevent mental retardation. But what are you going to pick? You're going to pick the embryo with the best, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're using basic education team because more than one can be people, not a few. You're going to pick the, the one with uh, highest educational attainment. Now, if they're honest, they'll say any individual prediction, that's why I showed you that other slide, is, is you know, we, there's just so many chance, other chance factors, other combinations. We can, no guarantee, no money back guarantee, right? On the other hand, on average, if you're in the highest, if you pick an embryo that's going to be in the highest death side of education, they, 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 they incur the better outcomes uh, than it's in the lowest death side. So it's, it's but, and, and so I asked uh, actually the head of the European, the incredible one of the European FDA, whether they thought they could bring it. I didn't think so, because pre-gestational diagnosis is, is a, it's a thing, it's done. And if, if IVF is legal in your country, as it is in most countries, and there's a very good reason for that, then people do PGD, and no one's going to stop you from putting it on a gene chip, and then, you know, uh, doing this kind of analysis. So who has to decide whether this is a good idea? We do. But this is a social issue, right? And the reason I showed you that there's no free lunch, right? The genes don't do one thing. Right? I started asking this going back to genes, because we didn't know genes were prime, we came for this to be the right. The same genes that might be doing some things you really want are doing other things you might not want. Right. If you want a kid that's really huggy, um, um, <laughs> doggy, right? Maybe, uh, we don't know, I mean, it's, may, maybe selecting the, the, the person with the highest educational attainment score is what you want. Do we really want to be in that business? I mean, this thing seems like a real nightmare version of, you know, uh, some, some, some science fiction movie. But this is a real company, right? They're, 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 this is happening. Here's another. Um, risk tolerance. There's been a very good GWAS for risk tolerance. So this something called the UK biome. So 500,000 people in the UK have been G-chipped. 
Uh, and they've agreed to be research subjects. 20,000 of them have been brain scanned. They answer all kinds of questionnaires and medical records are available. And you ask them questions like, how many speaking tickets have you gotten? How many drinks do you drink a week? How many sexual partners you can have? And you come up with a, with a, with a, a uh, Manhattan plot and therefore polygenic score for risky behavior, right? So just let me ask you, um, this, I think this is perfectly, you know, there's a law in the United States called GINA. You, your insurance, your health insurance company cannot get access to your genetic material because that would create all kinds of bad situations. But nowhere does GINA mention your automobile insurance. Um, uh, they would say, oh, great, we're in the business of managing risk. And here's, here's, we get, this is probabilistic, this is partial, this explains some small percent of the variance of risky behavior. Let me guess it's maybe only 15 or 20 percent of the variance, might be more. But we need that, we should have that information, right? Because uh, we, we can do a better job of deciding, you know, right now we, we even is it positive right now at 25? Before you're 25, you can't write that far. But what if you had a really favorable, low score for risky behavior? Maybe we thought you were in the car at 24. <laughs> Should that be legal? So these questions, so, so we started with public health, right? And the, 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 this mechanism that causes information is the first really good clues we have about the molecular basis of these mental illnesses so mysterious and so tragic, right? And, and I don't want to overcome this. It's going to take us decades to turn this information into pills and bottles and healthy. We're going to really talk about it. But the genie is out of the bottle, right? And not only is it out of the bottle with a $20 gene chip, but with UK Biobank and other such things where lots of human data is going online, including everybody's genotype. Um, maybe your insurance company doesn't even need you to agree. Maybe if you're if you're somebody who volunteered in UK Biobank, they'll just calculate it for you. And the next time you gotta rent a car, it'll cost more or less than <coughs> And so I don't know in what form we discuss. So this is clearly a very important and beneficial technology, but it's got implications that maybe we hadn't considered. And I just wanted to introduce to all of you that we have a lot of thinking to do here. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you very much, Dr. Hyman, for a great talk and uh, one that gets everybody thinking, I'm sure. We have a little bit of time for perhaps a couple of questions from the audience. So if you have a question, raise your hand and then I'll call on you and stand up. Yeah, Ryan, go ahead and stand up so we can hear you. Okay, so, so the point is that a statistically certain genetic association is a cause. That's, that's the difference. It's the one thing in biology because you've gotten your genome sequences at fertilization, right? So it's there ab initio, there from the very beginning. Whether it is a relevant cause, a very indirect cause, um, that you have to figure out right, when you decide what to work on. But, uh, but this is the one time where a correlation is a cause. And, and my friend Reed Montague over there, who's one of the smartest brain imagers around, would tell you, he, he, you have to always worry when you're doing any other biological examination that occurs in a, that that reflects a person after any years of development, experience, environmental exposures, you have the additional problem of understanding whether these correlates, no matter how statistically certain, are causally related or something we worry about a great deal, whether the causal arrows actually go the opposite way than, than we thought they did. So 
in genetics, we're privileged, right? Does, does that make does that make sense? Doesn't make it easy. But other questions? Okay, one more. Would you stand up, please? So we can hear you. Are you worried that in an attempt to mitigate risk for any of these factors that we discussed, we can get rid of potentially useful variations or things that cause complex? Sure. So um, nature is already getting rid of things it doesn't like, right? I mean, the reason that, so I, I mentioned that um, about 5 to 7% of autism is due to these new de novo mutations that produce very severe illness. And those kids, rarely, they tend not to reproduce. So those very severe genetic mutations, especially because they're early, before somebody has reproductive life, get washed out of the population. Interestingly, um, most single gene nastiness, n nasty mutations, even if they begin somewhat later in life, I think the most common one that we know of is Huntington's disease. There are about 50,000 cases, but for some reason, it seems that it, to, again, to put it in evolutionary terms, not ad hominem terms, it, they, these things decrease reproductive fitness. So nature is sort of partially weeding. Now, the thing about these, all of these many alleles of small effect that influence behavior is, yes, yeah, sometimes they can come together and create something absolutely horrible, a physical illness, a mental illness. Um, but in most combinations, they are neutral. Some, sometimes they may be positive, right? And so they stay in the gene pool. Um, and so the question, so, so, so right now the question of our mucking up our gene pool by embryo selection or in a few years we'll be asking about CRISPR, uh, I, I think I would answer is that will not affect a, a whole, you know, that will affect only the people who have IVF or, or people who are willing to undergo embryo gene editing. And I, I don't, I would not recommend anybody sign up for that as an early adopter. Right. Um, in the long run, what te I, you know, whether there'll be less invasive technologies or whether arranged marriages, a lot of the world is really about arranged, wh whether arranged marriages will involve a gene chip, I don't know. And that's when your question, but already today, um, among, in Israel, among, because Ashkenazi Jews are, are um, a population isolate. They were bottlenecked. As my son likes to say, we were down to 400 breeding pairs around the 13th century, <laughs> extinct in the wild. There are a lot of, um, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, recessive, when you go through a bottleneck, you weed out most genes, there are a lot of recessives like Tay-Sachs. Already uh, in ar arranged religious marriages, I, I think I have this right, people will have a you know, in the U.S., people just get gene tested and they decide whether to get married or have IVF and PGD. But in Israel, they send the, um, their gene results to the, to the rabbi and the rabbi says, you're a match, you're not a match, right? So this, writ small, this kind of embryo selection is already happening. I think what we worry about is that people will start to select for uh, the, these other traits, forgetting this what we call pleiotropic effects, forgetting that genes do lots of things, things we want, things we don't want. And then one of my undergraduate students pointed out that so many cultures are, are obsessed about uh, light skin. And, and this is not just, you know, this is not just race in the US, this is many Asian, in many Asian countries. And the most likely place where people would want to be GWAST and do these selections might be, you know, about uh, appearance, and it might be about skin. You know, this, this could reinforce really terrible racist tropes, and so, so, so yes, there's this evolutionary risk that we'll be sort of mucking, you know, evolution's always smarter than we are over time, but there are other really, real social hazards we should be thinking about if these technologies become widespread. Okay. If I can just take the liberty yeah. of asking a last quick question. Yeah. So beyond the genome, at the level of the epigenome, how much of the power of what we're not able to predict right now, likely when we have the sort of information and the analytic tools 
Will it be imprinted in the epigenome to explain most of it? Or? Yeah, no, uh, not most of it. No, no, I mean, because we already know that 80% of the variants in schizophrenia is expressed, is, is, is in germline genetics. So the epigenome is, got, is limited to some much smaller percentage. But the reason I didn't talk about the epigenome is not because it's not important. It's because I don't know how to get there. Epigenetics is exquisitely cell type specific. In fact, the basic issue with uh, the, the, the basic way that our single genome that every cell has, but one is making dopamine neurons in my brain and another is making my fingernail, right? That's epigenetic control. That is the differential expression of a common genome. And to, to study epigenetics in a meaningful way, I would need access to those cells. If I think that if somebody undergoes a severe stressor and that something is happening for real in their hippocampus, right now the only thing I can do is wait hopefully many, many, many years until they pass away and hope that the signal that I wanted is still there, it's highly unlikely. Uh, I might argue that in a grant that it's likely, but I don't really believe that. Uh, or I could measure the wrong thing, which is peripheral blood cells, but th they're very different from those dopamine, right? So we don't, we don't know how to get, yet, get access. There, there are ideas of doing this partly by using stem cell technologies and making neurons and making organoids and transplanting them into the brains of animal models, but that's another story. Okay, please join me in thanking Dr. Hunter for a good talk.